Well, hello and welcome to our Tuesday Bible study here on Tuesday, August the 4th. I hope your summer is going well. I hope you're getting uh, an overly filled portion of corn this summer and enjoying uh, the presence of your family wherever and whenever you can. Let's just begin with prayer today. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the many blessings of uh, the summer, the season, the time in which we live. We pray that you would continue to be with us as we are challenged by the season in which we're living. It is a frustrating time as we distance from one another. Bring us back to that time where we can be together. And this can be done with those sitting in front of me who want to interact with the Bible and hear about the Word of God and just feast not only in, in the presence of one another, but feast on the meal that we prepare for one another and feast on the presence of Jesus Christ. So bless us this day as we, uh, again, hear the Word of God. May it inspire us and, and help us through these difficult days, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I promise you that we've been looking at during the Tuesday night Bible studies, the continuous reading of the book of Genesis. Now, the continuous reading depends upon you doing your reading between now and the next Tuesday. I'm actually reading Sunday's appointed lesson. But if you read every day small portions of the book of Genesis, you will, by the end of the summer again, get through the entire book of Genesis. It's kind of a cool little continuous reading through the lectionary that we are doing. Uh, so we're skipping a few parts, but the last time I left you, you know, Jacob had just gotten married. And if you remember, his father-in-law kind of swindled him. He, he, uh, Jacob really wanted to meet Rachel and marry Ma Rachel. That was a girl whom he loved, except she was the younger daughter. And so Laban, uh, Rachel's father, pulled a fast one on him and married him off to Leah, the older daughter. And Jacob's like, hey, what the heck is the deal? And he said, well, I could very well marry my younger daughter off to you before I married my older daughter off. He said, you can have the other one too that you really want if you stay another seven years and work for me. So Laban got another seven years of free labor. It's kind of one of these crazy things. It seems like Jacob met his match. Remember, Jacob, his name means heel grasper. And he lives his life trying to take what doesn't belong to him. But here he's finally met his whack match in his father-in-law. But this doesn't sit well with him. So over these 14 years that he's married to these, these uh, women and he spends with Laban, he starts to swindle his father-in-law. He's getting them back, you see. And you'll have to read about that and how he does that. But he swindles his father-in-law, deceives him. He becomes wealthy himself at the expense of Laban. He figures he's got them back. So he finally decides to take all of his possessions, basically leaving Laban with almost nothing. He takes everything, including the kettle and the and the pot and the, and the coffee maker and just about everything else you could possibly imagine. The family gods, we're going to have to read about that one. That comes in a lesson or two. And they all take off. Where are they going to go? He's going to establish himself as his own head of his own household. Laban doesn't, this doesn't suit well very, uh, very much with Laban. I mean, after all, where's Jacob going to go? So Laban and his army pursues Jacob, and finally they tussle for a bit. They come to a terms of peace, a peace treaty, and then there you go. But Jacob's not welcome home with Laban anymore. Where's he going to go? He says, oh, I don't know. I got a good idea. I'm going to go home. I'm going to go uh, to my brother, to Esau. Wait a minute. <laughs> what? Do you remember what in the world happened the last time Jacob and Esau saw each other? Jacob swindled Esau out of his inheritance and out of his birthright. Are you kidding me? Do you think Esau's going to be very happy to see him? <laughs> oh my goodness, this is not the best of ideas. But Jacob's got a plan, as he always does. His great plan is to send all of his wealth ahead of him. So much wealth that Esau couldn't even handle it. And so and say, here, Esau, this is yours. You can have it back. Okay? He's still not sure, though. So we're told in the lesson right before we start here today. What does he do? Oh, just wait, just wait. In today's lesson, he, uh, he sends everything ahead of him, including his family. And then in today's lesson, at night, when he's all by himself, he wrestles. He wrestles with God. And he wins! except God cheats. <laughs> so you're going to see in a minute. So let's take a look at the lesson. It's kind of a hilarious lesson. 
don't try to make too much sense. These are people who really try to fit this into the theology about God and this and that. Well, we are supposed to learn some things about God. And this is a personification, I guess you could say, of God that we're going to see in just a moment uh, that's revealed to Jacob. But let's not put our heads around this too much. It's a story. And it's a story that's trying to communicate to us something about Jacob and something about God's love. So let's, let's take a listen to this. That same night, Jacob, this is again after he sent all of his wealth ahead of him to his brother Esau, he got up, he took his two wives, his two maids, his 11 children, and they crossed the ford at the Jabbok. He took and sent them across the stream and likewise everything that he had. What a flipping coward. So in other words, Jacob sent everything ahead and decides, well, they're going to have to slaughter all of them before they can get to me. Huh. I mean, really, think about that. What type of self-respecting man would do it? You'd think he would go if you're truly covering his family. And I'm serious about this. If you're truly a goodly, godly man, he would have gone ahead and confronted his brother and said, look, if you're mad at me, I get it. Please don't take it out of my family. Oh, no, he sends his whole family ahead to Esau, not knowing what his brother might do. His brother could literally slaughter them. Coward. Not Esau, but Jacob, coward. He's a real piece of work. So let's go on. Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until break, daybreak. Pfft, who knows? Okay, don't think through this too much. It's a story. Okay? It's a story about his wrestle. His wrestling with this guy. Who is this guy? It's going to be real to us a little bit later. And it's, it's you know, just hang tight. So Jacob wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip and knocked it out of joint as he wrestled with him. <laughs> I love it. So, again, so he's wrestling with this guy. The guy realizes he's in a heap of trouble, that Jacob is just maybe prevailing. So he kind of cheats. He knocks his, Jacob's hip out of joint. Kind of would get him a penalty if you're out actually in a wrestling match somewhere, I guess. I don't know. And then what does Jacob do? Jacob's holding on for dear life. He's not going to let this guy go. So, he said, let me go, the man says, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Okay. He's always trying to take by force what doesn't belong to him. Remember, this is what we said about Jacob, the heel grasper. So the man said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. The man said, you should no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you've striven with God and with humans, and you prevail. Okay. You may not be aware of this, but that is what the name Israel means. The one who wrestles with God. I'm not sure that's any better than heel grasper. But now Jacob becomes the eponymous ancestor of the nation of Israel. It is now named after him, the one who wrestles with God. Again, is this a compliment, isn't it? Hmm. Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. See, there's power in a name. It's interesting I want you to think about this because we're supposed to reflect upon who this is. Who is this? Who is it that's wrestling with Jacob? And I don't understand this. It's kind of confusing, except you have to think in the way of Jewish theology. Who is the person who named things in the book of Genesis? Well, God did in Genesis 1. And then with companionship of Adam and Eve... God and Adam and Eve named it in Genesis chapter 2. And as we go on, when you are given the authority to give something a name, you have authority over that thing that you name. So the person who named Jacob Israel, who changed Jacob's name to Israel, has authority over top of him. But notice, he never gives Jacob his name. He's not going to do that. He's not going to give Jacob any power over him. That's important. 
So Jacob back to him, again, please tell me your name. But the man, but there, uh, why, um, but the man said, why is it that you ask me my name? And there he blessed him. So he didn't give him his name. He wouldn't give him any power over him, but he did bless him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I've seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. So who did Jacob come out believing that he had seen? He believed that the one with whom he wrestled was God. Now, I don't know, is this a literal story? Is it a figure story? It doesn't matter. The point is, is that Jacob wrestled all night long. And maybe you've had nights like that too, where you and God have been tussling away because you're angry about something. You're angry at God. Maybe you lost your wife to cancer and you and God are having it out. I don't blame you. Something were to happen to my wife, to my daughter, God and I would be having it out. Okay? Something happened to, to me. I lost mobility in some way. God and I would be having it out. Because this is part of being human. God doesn't get upset with Jacob or this man, whoever he's wrestling with, wink, wink, that we know is God. He actually responds positively to Jacob's wrestling with him. Wrestling with God, I want you to understand, is a normal part of a person's faith journey. You know, it was told to me one time, oh, many times, maybe your parents have told you this. Maybe somebody in your church told you this. I can guarantee you, you've never heard this from me. You can't question God. Really? Then how come the Bible is filled with so many faithful questioners? How come the eponymous man, who's upon, the eponymous ancestor of the nation of Israel, is noted for being the man who wrestled with God? That's who Israel is supposed to be. They're supposed to tussle and wrestle with God. This is their character. This is their nature. We're going to see this play out in the chapters that come, how Israel constantly wrestles with God, but God always still blesses them. So I'm telling you, the next time somebody tells you, you can't question God, say, of course I can. My ancestor Jacob did. My ancestor Abraham did. My ancestor Isaac did. My ancestors, all the way back to the beginning of time, wrestled and questioned and doubted and struggled. You see, wrestling with God, doubt is not the antithesis of faith. It's not. It's a part of the faith experience that we question, we wrestle with God, and we doubt. But God never gives up on us. Faith is not a lack of doubt. Faith is not a lack of questioning or wrestling with God. Faith is wrestling with God, questioning with God, but then what does Jacob do? He holds on for dear life. Despite his doubts, despite his questions, Despite his wrestling, he won't let go. But here's the better news. God never lets go of us. This is a great story. I'm a wrestler, people. I'm outright telling you, if you want a pastor who doesn't question God, who doesn't doubt, you got the wrong guy. I doubt, I wrestle, I question all the time. Here's the best news of all. The people who wrestle, who doubt, who question are the very people that God chooses to be the greatest of all. You want to know why? Because those who doubt, those who wrestle, those who question end up having a stronger faith as a result of it. So don't fear wrestling with God. Don't fear the doubts. Embrace them. Because out of that, God is going to embolden and strengthen your faith. 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of Jacob. I think this truly is how we're supposed to be. Yes, he was a swindler and a conniver. He, 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 I, well, maybe that's not what we're supposed to do. But you know what? He was wrestling and trying to find his way in life. He was wrestling with his faith. As personified here in this story about him wrestling with this man. Heavenly Father, we wrestle with you all the time. And it's okay. My ancestor was a doubter and a wrestler who struggled with God. And yet you blessed him to be the father of all nations. God, the Bible's filled with people who wrestle and struggle and tussle with you. It is out of that wrestling and that struggling and that tussling that our faith truly develops a deep and abiding and a strong faith. So God, sustain us through our doubts. Make us stronger in our relationship with you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Go wrestle with God. And let God bring to you a deeper faith. Amen.